Grace and peace to you all. And welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. And the deal is he's like, look what they've done. And, and I'm the only righteous guy left. I hope you never feel like that. I never, I never feel isolated from the fellowship of the saints. And, and no matter what happens, I realize I'm one among millions of people that love and worship and serve our Lord. In today's broadcast, we have a new two-part study from Pastor Sam entitled, A Faithful God. We're now in Romans chapter 11, and herein Paul discusses how, despite the fact that the Jews, for the most part, had rejected Christ, God remains faithful to fulfill His promises to them. So, let's listen in. We are living in the last days, the days promised by the prophets and confirmed by Jesus. He tells us in Matthew 24 that these things that have always been taking place, famines and pestilence and earthquakes and well, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom and well, false Christ and false prophets abounding. We know that's always been happening, but he says in the last days they'll increase in frequency and intensity. And we see both happening. But it's important to note, there have been seasons throughout church history where similar things have happened. And people thought, this is it. These are the last days. Here's why we can be sure these are the last days. God promised that in the last days, he would do something that's never been done. He likes to do that. Take something that never been done, that can't be done, and then make it happen. Why? He says that's how we can know it's him. He said he was going to regather the nation of Israel back to the land that he first gave to them, and then he was going to do that in unbelief. In other words, they would come back to the land, but not yet to Jesus. Then, he says, later he would open their eyes. In between, well, these are the days in which we're living. What's next on the prophetic calendar? Well, the resurrection of the dead and rapture of the church will come first. The trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. We were alive and remain will be caught up together with them to be with him. It's a glorious reunion with those who've gone before us, a time of celebrating and rejoicing in the presence of the Lord as we cast our crowns at his feet and cry, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. So the rapture of the church followed by the tribulation, God's wrath poured out on a Christ rejecting world. Now, during that season of tribulation, somewhere during the seven year period, divided into the tribulation and the great tribulation, latter three and a half years, Israel's eyes will be opened. In other words, he's restored them to the land as a sign to them and to us that it's really him. And here's what happened in church history. For the first few hundred years, most believers took it literally that Israel would be regathered. They were dispersed in 70 AD, but the promises were to the nation that God would bring them back. And then someone came up with the idea, well, maybe he didn't mean it literally. Maybe the church are heirs of the promises made to Israel. Here's the promise with that, or the problem with that. Israel and the church have been, are today, and will always be distinct. God had a specific plan, made specific promises to them. They were to inherit temporal blessings and earthly places. What does he tell us about our blessings? We have uh, eternal blessings in the heavenlies, reserved and kept for us in Christ Jesus. They were promised a land. We're promised the Lord. Now, they're going to have both, but here's my point. Over the centuries, and well, it's been nearly 20, and, and so what's happened? Well, more and more people have bought into the idea, well, maybe he didn't mean it literally. Then in 1948, we find them not only back in the land, but a nation once again. 
Now, they're living in unbelief. The majority of people in Israel not only reject Jesus as the Messiah, many of them reject the idea there's even a God. It is, for the most part, lots of secularism, many atheists and agnostics there. But God's promise is that he will open their eyes. So we have the coming resurrection and rapture, then the tribulation, the restoration of the nation of Israel. Then Jesus returns to the earth for a literal thousand-year reign and rule where he tells us we will return with him and rule and reign alongside of him. That's the promised kingdom, you see. And Israel will be a part of that kingdom. Well, God, of course, promised to keep us from the tribul tribulation, tribulation, whatever. He promised to keep us from both. And, uh, but but uh, in, in Luke, Jesus said, pray that you'll be found worthy to escape all these things that will come upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. The second is actually the most important. It's not just protected and hidden during the tribulation, but in the presence of God, worshiping as his wrath is being poured out and saying, that is so right, Lord, that is so perfect. Everything God does is right and just and perfect. Well, we have pictures, of course, of God keeping his people from the hour of tribulation. Noah was in the ark with his family before his wrath was poured out on that generation. We'll talk about Noah again in a bit. Lot rescued out of Sodom before his wrath was poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. But we have an even more interesting picture when Daniel's three friends go into a time of tribulation because we have no clue where Daniel was. All we know is Daniel wasn't there. And I think Daniel in that scene where Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are cast into the fiery furnace where Jesus actually walks with them and preserves and protects them. Well, I think Daniel's absence is a picture for us. See, Daniel representing the church that will be taken out before the wrath of God. And, and then Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego representing Israel who were preserved through the tribulation and in the tribulation. Well, in any case, all of this leads us to verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? The answer, of course, certainly not. The question arises because we know Israel was unfaithful to God. The question then is, will God be unfaithful to Israel? Paul just says that can't happen. Why? Well, we serve a God who Paul tells us later cannot lie. And he made promises that can only be fulfilled in them and to them and even through them. Now, Paul gives a series of illustrations, uh, of, of proofs, if you will. He makes himself the first. He says, God's not done with Israel. Here's how you can know. I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who you should know, and if you're new to all this, you need to know, Jacob becomes Israel. God changes his name after the most interesting mixed martial arts evening. He wrestles with God all night, and finally, as God's saying, hey, it's daybreak, I'm taking off, he, he, he says, no, don't leave without blessing me. And he clung to him and cried out to him, and God says, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name will now be Israel. Israel, if you're unaware, means governed by God. Jacob, who was like the Frank Sinatra of his day, he did it his way, now finds out it's got to be the Lord. And that's exactly what happens. So he says, God was faithful, will be, has been, will always be faithful to Israel in spite of their unfaithfulness to him. And that is security for us because, well, we have been unfaithful too. We have not perfectly represented our Lord in our day. We're the light of the world, he says. But some of us, well, 
they don't really seem that bright. And, and so God is saying, look, I'm going to use you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to transform you. And, and it's all him from beginning to end. He says God has not cast away his people. And by the way, he means Israel here. How do we know? He says, I'm an Israelite. We read it. Seed of Abraham, tribe of Benjamin. The church has never been made up of the tribes of Israel. There will be Israelites, though, in the church, and we'll see that in a moment, a beautiful illustration from the first century. And so it's not that those who are of Israel can't be a part of the church, it's just the church never became a part of Israel. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, They've killed your prophets, torn down your altars, and I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah was suffering from what we might call a Noah complex. See, in Noah's day, Noah was the only righteous man. Elijah's thinking, I'm the only one left, Lord. I mean, they've killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and now they're after me. There actually was just a one. It was a not a he, but a she. He'd faced off with the 450 prophets of Baal successfully. Did them in, took them down. And then he hears Jezebel's after him and he runs and hides. Now, that might be wisdom. You know, not afraid of 450 guys, afraid of one woman. She was a woman who was, you know, very wrathful and vengeful and dangerous. But, but listen, God sees what's up. And, and I remember my buddy Gail Irwin saying, if you're going to hide from God, I wouldn't suggest his backyard. And, and here's Elijah. Not so much hiding from God, but hiding from Jezebel. And so what happens? God appears to him. Elijah's traveled a great distance. He's hiding out in a cave. And God shows up, and and as he comes, we're told there was a great wind, but God was not in the wind. There was a great earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. Then a great fire, but God was not in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. And it's such an encouragement to me and hopefully to you as well. It's saying when you're in sin, when you're disobeying, when you're fearing, when you're running, when you're whimpering and complaining and and Elijah's doing all those things, it's not the big wind uh, or, or the earthquake or the fire. God comes and speaks to us. He whispers in our ear, what are you doing here? What's the matter with you? What are you doing way out here? Your ministry's back there. Oh, Lord, don't you know what's up? Usually he's pretty aware, I found. And the deal is he's like, look what they've done. And I'm the only righteous guy left. I hope you never feel like that. I never never feel isolated from the fellowship of the saints. And and no matter what happens, I realize I'm one among millions of people that love and worship and serve our Lord. But Elijah's thinking, I'm the only one. Now, I mentioned that the church never became Jewish, but that's not to say that Jews haven't become or aren't a part of the church. No, they have been down through the ages. In fact, the first church was there in Jerusalem. And it was birthed only 40 days after the cross. People had come to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. Now, who attended that feast? The Jews, the Israelites from the 12 tribes. They all came to celebrate. There were proselytes, so some were Gentiles. And they were trying to become Jews because Jews had, well, they had a relationship with God. They had a temple. They had the feast. They had the festivals. They had the sacrifices. They had... The word of God, the Old Testament. They had the prophets. They had the history. They had the prophecy. And so, so what happens is, is they gather for Passover and Jesus dies at the Passover feast. He dies for our sins 
is buried and rose again. Forty days later, the Spirit of God is poured out at the Feast of Pentecost. Who's attending? Mostly Jews. Well, when I say Jew, I'm talking about the nation, but Jew technically, that would be a descendant of Judah. See, Judah, Jew. So so, uh, Israel is actually the 12 tribes. And so they were back to attend the feast. So when 3,000 people responded to Peter's preaching of the gospel that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again, a church of 120 became a church of 3,120. Most of them, almost all of them, were certainly Jewish or Israelite in their background. So my point in sharing that is that the early church was in fact the proof, and that's what Paul's saying here, that God preserved a remnant of Israel. Lots of people were unfaithful, but these people responded to Jesus. They responded to the gospel. Jesus became their savior as he's become our savior. Now, Paul's writing to the Romans. The church at Rome was primarily made up of Gentiles. That's not to say there weren't any Jewish believers there. And one of the issues he'll deal with as you go through the various letters he writes, and that's what's happening, letter to Rome, letter to the church at Corinth, letter to the church uh, there in the region of Galatia, and there's 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Corinth is just another city. So, So as you read those letters, understand that's what you're reading, a letter to a church just like ours in a certain location in the first century. Well, what happened is there were a lot of Jewish Christians especially in Jerusalem, that thought, well, in order to really be a good Christian, those Gentiles should become Jewish. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to keep the law. We've looked at this, and we'll consider it again as we press through Paul's various letters. And and the whole deal is, again and again, Paul defends, no, it's not about Christians becoming Jews. It's about Gentiles and, and Jews becoming Christians. Finding the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior, Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus. So he says, hey, I'm a living example that God hasn't given up on Israel. And what about the people that God has preserved and transformed and used down through the ages? Verse 5, he says, and he's writing in the first century, even so then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of, of grace. Now, here's what happens. Because so many people teach just a verse or a phrase or get a concept and don't really see the context of all of that, it would be easy if I were only teaching verse 5 to focus on the words remnant and the, the, the word election and touch on the reality of grace. But the message here isn't, well, God elected some to be with him and elected others not to be. You know, we elect people. We use that word in a different way. We elect people, then we suffer the consequences. But but they, when, when we're talking about biblical election, we're talking about God actually choosing people to be with them. And the logical mind, and I think I have one of those, can say, well, if he chose some to be With them, he must have chosen some not to be with them. But here's what happens. You'll never find that in Scripture. There's nowhere it says God chose you for heaven and somewhere else for hell. It just isn't there. So you can't just use logic and take an idea and say, well, if this is true, this must be true. You have to read the whole Bible and you need to put it all together. And if you think, well, no, that's your job. You know, we just come and listen to you. Well, that's fine, except for God is going to hold you accountable because you have a Bible. We're not living in the first century where you couldn't get a copy. In fact, how many of you have a smartphone? I'm just curious, and I really want to see your hands. I know there are more of you. Quick. Okay, listen, if you have a smartphone, you can download the Bible for free. Multiple versions are available. Multiple translations are available. There's no excuse for not having the Bible with you all the time. I don't carry a big Bible around with me, you know, like so everybody knows. No, I, I, but I have my phone and I have the Bible. And when I'm sitting in traffic, 
which happens, or not as much here as when we were in Southern Cal recently, but, but uh, when I'm in a doctor's office or waiting somewhere for someone, like when I went shopping with Pam and waited for five hours, I, uh, I, 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 that actually happened, by the way. I had a book and almost finished it, but, but, I, but I, I just opened my phone and read the Bible. And, and, it's, and I want to encourage you to do the same thing because God says, study and show yourself approved. Not just study with the pastor, but study yourself. Because he will open the word to you. And if you read it in context and you just take it at face value, you'll be surprised to see that you understand most of what you read. This idea that, well, we can't understand the Bible. I think that was a lie started by the enemy. That, the, oh, you can't understand it. It's too complicated. Revelation, people say, oh, it's so complicated. You can't understand it. And God says, blessed is the one who reads it. And blessed is the one who hears it. And blessed is the one who does it. And I'm thinking, so how are we blessed if we can't understand it? The truth is we can understand it and, and, it, and we need to. So the, the point he's making here is there has always been, just as there was in the day of Elijah, he said, I got 7,000 of you, guy. And, and now he's saying there's always a, a, a remnant according to the election of grace. And the key word here is grace. How do I know? Verse 6, if by grace... It is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Grace, by the way, if you're unaware, God's riches at Christ's expense. You write it out, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. It speaks to the reality that all we have from him is a gift. I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it. It's not a reward for my faithfulness. It's a testimony to his goodness and his faithfulness. Well, again, there was a remnant because the early church was made up of people from Israel, especially the church in Jerusalem, as I shared. James writes to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. He knows that they're dispersed, but it doesn't matter to him. He figures the letter will get circulated, and those of a Jewish heritage, they'll all get it. Jesus, though, nails this for us. When he tells his disciples, in the regeneration, you who followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, if you're thinking, well, does it really matter if it's really Israel or if the church is Israel? Absolutely, because the rapture is something promised to the church. The tribulation is something promised to Israel, and then their restoration. So I have Jewish friends, and they're like, well, I am a Christian, but I really feel like I need to worship as a Jew. And that makes no sense to me. I'm not saying it's wrong to celebrate the feast or the festivals, we celebrate Passover and sometimes we'll do a feast here at church. And, but but the, the point is, we don't want to get caught up in the law. We don't want to get caught up in the ceremony or the, 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 the very thing that kept them from really seeing Jesus. I love what Pastor said about the lie of the enemy, which convinces us we cannot understand the Bible. I don't love the lie. I love that Pastor Sam identified it as a lie. He talked about how people think the book of Revelation is hard to understand, and many people think that Paul's writings are hard to understand as well. However, one act of prayer and faith that God will always honor is when we desire for God to open our eyes and minds so that we can hear from Him when we read His Word. 1 Corinthians 18 tells us, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. And a big part of that is the work of the Holy Spirit who brings us understanding of the things we read. Don't hesitate to dive into the Word of God. Don't ever sell yourself short and think you're not smart enough to understand it. You have an advocate in the Holy Spirit who will help you understand whatever it is that He wants you to understand, and it is simply a matter of asking. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you soon. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.